Welcome to the year-end special Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial and the co-host of Michelle Miao Show at the club. And we hope you are staying safe and are well wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you again in person one day at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. But until that happens, we are doing all of our programming online. This is the latest in nearly 350 online programs the club has produced in the past eight months. You can find all of our upcoming programs, as well as podcasts and videos from our past events and how you can help support us at commonwealthclub.org. Now, for the past several years, the Commonwealth Club has presented a year-end Michelle Miao show program and party. We had food and drink, an interesting guest speaker, and uh, special guests such as Santa Claus. Well, this year, of course, we can't do all of that, but we are holding this online version of it. And tonight you'll meet an up and coming LGBTQ political leader. We'll have some celebrity cameos and we'll all around give 2020 the ending it deserves. Now I mentioned that the club has done nearly 350 online programs since the pandemic struck. Almost 50 of those have been Michelle Miao show programs in which Michelle and I have explored everything from COVID in the LGBTQ community to anti-Asian racism. We talked with politicians and activists and filmmakers interviewed brave pro-democracy journalists and activists, one of whom was recently jailed in Hong Kong, and another who is being indicted by her government. We held a series of programs with San Francisco Pride, and we made history by hosting the live streaming of Global Pride, a worldwide celebration of LGBT people and issues that attracted an audience of 57 million people. And all that was done in a year of a horrible pandemic, economic crisis, vitriolic presidential campaign, and countless protests and counter-protests over racial injustice. So we're glad you made it through this year with us, and we're glad you're joining us here tonight for this celebration. Let's start it by seeing some famous faces and some worldwide impact. The Commonwealth Club is a San Francisco treasure. It's the preeminent institution that embodies the essence of everything that makes the Bay Area special. We value everyone's opinion. Uh, we value the truth. We value the process of exchanging viewpoints. We value learning. And at a time when social discourse seems completely fractured, the Commonwealth Club remains more important than ever in doing what it's always done and what it's always been, a San Francisco institution. Hey there, I'm Adam Rippon, Winter Olympic medalist, media extraordinaire, author, and it was so great to join Michelle Miao and John at the club to discuss my memoir, Beautiful on the Outside. The work of the club is so important, especially during these times when free speech is being abused or even used as hate speech. We all know exactly what it's like to have someone spread lies and misinformation as a way to oppress. And there's no room for that now and in the future. We have to stand up for one another. We need to create opportunities for understanding, for information, and for acceptance. Keep up the great work of the Commonwealth Club of California, and I hope all of you continue your support of the club. Welcome to Global Pride. I'm Todd Hall. Global Pride is a historic Pride event that gives us the ability, the energy, and the excitement to celebrate each other and ourselves. Pride is, and always has been, a resistance. While we are decades removed from the Stonewall riots, we still have so much farther to go. We have overcome so much. There is so much to celebrate in that regard. Our present, we must remember to use our voices to demand justice and equality for everybody. Our society needs to look at diversity with a lens of intersectionality. When we stand in solidarity with one another, when we stand up for one another, that there's nothing that we can't accomplish. We stand united on a global stage. We create space to advocate, educate, and celebrate. Pride isn't just about the party, it's about the people. It's about the youth in our community, our seniors, trans and gender non-conforming friends and neighbors, people of color, the disabled, immunocompromised, the homeless, our veterans, and those raising families. We are all on this road together. Happy Pride.
There you got a sense of some of what we've gone through and, and talked about and explored and celebrated over the past year. We want to thank everyone who supported the Michelle Miao Show this past year. All of you who watched or listened to it, who shared our stories and our videos and our, our podcasts on social media, everyone who was a guest on the program and everyone who contacted us with ideas and feedback. And of course, everyone who provided the financial support to put together this ambitious slate of online programming. Now I want to introduce Jen Bishop of Weatherford BMW of Berkeley, which has generously provided support for this special Meow, Michelle Meow show at the Commonwealth Club program. Jen? Thanks, John, for the introduction, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's an honor to support the Michelle Meow show, an LGBTQ inclusive program since it started in 2008. Wow, Michelle, it's been a long time. Although LGBTQ folks are becoming more visible in the media, we're proud to support a program that brings all of our communities together to have conversations with an intersectional view. This year was particularly tough, but we're proud that the program was able to continue addressing issues like how COVID-19 impacted our communities, AIDS 2020, and the Supreme Court decision on LGBTQ workplace. During a year in which we saw our pride celebrations being canceled, we're excited to see the Michelle Miao Show celebrate pride through programs like Global Pride and the LGBTQ Lavender Series. We're so proud of the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California and look forward to what they'll accomplish in 2021. And now without further ado, I'm excited to introduce you to the last program of the year, Making History with Sarah McBride. You all know Michelle Miao, our host, but here's a little bit about Sarah. Sarah is an American activist and politician who is a Delaware state senator elect set to be sworn in in January 2021. She's currently the National Press Secretary for the Human Rights Campaign, and after winning the September 2020 Democratic primary in the first Delaware State Senate District, she won the November 2020 election. When she is sworn in, she will become the first transgender state senator in the country making her the highest ranking transgender official in United States history. So here they are, Michelle, John, and Sarah McBride. <laughs> I'm filled with so many emotions. Gosh, wow. I can't believe it's, uh, you know, the middle of December. It's the last Michelle Miao show of the year of this year of the pandemic. And, and at the same time, I'm filled with so much gratitude that we have great, amazing news where there's a sigh of relief. I know, you know, some folks have already uh, texted us from the previous program about the Supreme Court decision that pretty much, uh, well, we'll talk about that another time because <laughs> I don't want to hamper what we're going to talk about right now. But the fact that we have so much to celebrate we have so much to celebrate. And the person that we are celebrating this last program and we'll go into celebrating 2021 and the hope, the hope for, you know, a much more positive year for all of us is someone who is making history, who's made history, Sarah McBride. Oh my gosh. I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled that you're here with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be on your on your program, and it's uh, an honor to be your final show of the year. I, I like to think that you saved the best for last, but we'll see. Um, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I know that you know we uh, we had you on before when your memoir came out, which I did a crash reading uh, of of all five hundred and some pages, but <laughs> or at least that's what it was on my iBook, but. Um, 
you had written me back and you said, you know, I want to save the interview opportunity because I'm going to run for office. And I remember I kept that email. And then here you are, you know, you're here, <laughs> you won your election, but it's not just that, you know, you're, you're, you've won your election as did, you know, president-elect, uh, you know, Joe Biden and um, vice president-elect Kamala Harris. I mean, there's, there's a lot to celebrate but let's talk about you. Let's get to know you a little bit more. Um, you know, in reading your memoir, I have to say, politics seemed to be in your blood. It seemed to have been something that you're born to do. You're born for this very moment. So why don't you tell us, you know, that moment in which you realize that you you love politics. You're going to do it. Was it was there a, a situation or, or an issue that motivated you? Um, I can imagine you at six, seven years old, I don't know, tuning into CNN or something and saying like, that's wrong. I'm going to change that. <laughs> I, 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 that. That's more true than I, I'd care to admit. Um, no, it, you know, I, I think in many ways I became interested in politics and government and advocacy in large part because of my own struggle with coming to terms with myself and figuring out how I fit into this world. Because as I became aware of the fact that there was something about me that society didn't accept and, and didn't include that my gender identity was a, a, a barrier and a, and a, and a, um, uh, a, 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 a fact about me that many people held deep prejudices about as I became very aware of that very at a very young age, I, I also saw that politics seemed to be the place where you could make the most amount of change for the most number of people in the most number of ways possible. And that if perhaps I couldn't live authentically, maybe I could make my life worth living. Maybe I could heal the pain and fill the void in my life by making a difference in my community, by making a difference for other people, by making a world and building a world where other people could live their life authentically, fully, and freely. And so I got involved in politics in large part because of that. Reading the history books as a young kid, I was a voracious reader of history. I saw that every single chapter was about advocates, activists, everyday people, and yes, political leaders with the courage to act, who through their persistence and, and, and political courage help to, to deepen our understanding of we the people and expand the circle of opportunity. Um, and so I got involved and, and got hooked at a young age, but it also became very clear very quickly that as professionally fulfilling as it was to make a difference in my community at a, at a young age, that that professional fulfillment wouldn't fill the void in my life. And if anything, it only highlighted the incompleteness even more. We can get into that more. I, I would just sticking on the political side. There are a lot of different ways people go about getting into politics or preparing themselves for it. Some people become billionaire real estate developers, um, but uh, obviously, you know, law school or, or or training such. What was your path once you decided? Yes, this is the way I can make change and and such. What did you do then to go about realizing this? Well, well, I, I certainly didn't start a a billion dollar or probably more accurately million dollar uh, real estate. <laughs> um, you, you know, the great thing about where I live, Delaware, um, the, the, the home state of our future president, um, is that it's a small state and it's very easy to get involved. We see our elected officials. We see our, our U.S. senator. Hell, we see our president elect in the grocery store taking a walk down the street. Um, it, it's really an incredibly intimate place. I call us a, a state of neighbors um, because it's really a, a small town that's a state. Uh, and, and so it's easy to get involved. And, and I started first off just showing up, volunteering, um, making phone calls, knocking on doors, stuffing envelopes, um, you know, cheering in, in parades, uh, starting at a young age, 13. Uh, I went on to college at American University, majoring in government, and had the opportunity uh, in high school and college to work on campaigns, eventually, um, even after coming out as trans, interning in the Obama White House. And, and 
cutting my teeth in advocacy here in Delaware and eventually nationally with the human rights campaign. And, and so in many ways, I, I sort of stumbled into it. Um, in many ways, I just sort of showed up until someone, you know, gave me a task. And then eventually I kept showing up and they'd give me, you know, more significant tasks and then eventually put me on payroll. And then eventually, you know, I, I, I was introducing our future governor at political events. And so it, it was um, sort of an organic journey. Um, and not a traditional one, right? I, I'm I'm not an attorney. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, a real estate developer. Um, but that's the beauty of Delaware politics: is is you can get involved even at a young age as one person and really get to know your political leaders and have a real say in their campaigns and even in their uh, in their government service. Talk about you know who you know and, and why, you know, relationships are so important. You just, you just never know who they'll be in the future. Uh, the forward in your memoir is written by president like Joe Biden. And um, it's so special. I mean, you know, here the president elect speaks about your coming out and goes back you know, to talking about knowing you since 2006 and then even puts in the importance of, of you coming out, I, I don't, I don't recall ever that that has happened or that I've read about, you know, a situation like that, that you know, somebody as high up as Joe Biden speaks so openly and so, so tenderly and caring about us in that way. Um, it, it, yeah. Tell us, you know, just how you got connected with the Biden family. I know it as I read about it, but you tell the story better. Well, you know, it's it, Delaware's, like I said, a small state and the, the saying goes here, everyone's dated, mated or related. Um, and we are all related to Joe Biden one way or another. Um, we're all part of the Biden family here in Delaware. Um, you know, I, I think anyone who grew up long known that that Joe Biden um, is a, a decent, generous, compassionate person and had what it took to go all the way to become president of the United States. Um, so growing up as a kid, you know, I, I remember, again, as a small state, this, this, this larger than life figure, Joe Biden, who, who was on the national stage, and there was this presidential buzz. Um, I, I remember when I was about 12, 11 or 12, I was at a, a pizza shop in the district I now represent, just a couple blocks from where I grew up and just a couple blocks from where I am right now. Um, having dinner with my parents and and in walks Jill Biden and sits at the, the pizza table right next to us. And then in, in walks Joe Biden and uh, me as an 11 year old kid who's just, you know, getting interested in politics and turning on CNN and screaming at the TV, like you mentioned, <laughs> it was a huge deal to be able to see, to be able to see him in the flesh. And he could see that I was so excited that he was there and, and, and he came over and, and, put down his briefcase and leaned down and, and talked to me eye level and, and, you know, asked about me and asked about what my interests were and then ripped a page out of his schedule and, and wrote <laughs> probably what he wrote to every single young person he met. Remember me when you're president, Joe Biden. And, um, and, and it was one of my prized possessions, but then I didn't really get to know the Biden family super well until like you mentioned, 2006, when I went to work for his son, Bo, on his campaign for attorney general. And, and similar to Vice President-elect Harris, I really got to know Joe Biden through the eyes of Bo. And, you know, the, 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 the relationship between Joe and Bo was so deep and so profound. It was exactly how, you know, sometimes this, this mythology develops in 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 the national coverage of these figures and it's 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 almost you know overwrought and over the top but it, it's all true about Joe and Bo they worshiped one another he still worships his son Bo um he loved him so much and loves him so much and J Bo was the real deal he was as good and decent behind closed doors as he was out in public and so I had the opportunity to work for Bo, become uh, not just someone uh, who, who got to call him a boss, but also a friend and a mentor. Um, and then got to know Joe through Bo. And it really was after Bo passed away from cancer that 
the vice president, then vice president, and I got even closer because in many ways, you know, Joe was a long supporter of LGBTQ equality coming out in favor of marriage equality before President Obama. Frankly, I think one of the things that's that's covered that's covered less, but is even more significant, was his trailblazing support on trans rights, calling it a civil rights issue long before any national politician was even coming close to the issue. But then after Bo passed away, I think in many ways, because Bo really fought for LGBTQ equality as attorney general, helping to lead the effort for marriage equality and working with me very closely to pass protections for transgender people. I think after Bo's passing in many ways, Joe took his own passion and support for our community met it with his desire to help carry on the legacy of his son. And because of that, LGBTQ equality became a priority for him. And when he opened the Biden Foundation after his time as vice president, he made LGBTQ equality a central pillar, I think in large part because of uh, of Bo's legacy and as a tribute to him. You, We were talking a little bit earlier about your own personal coming to realization of, of your your true self and, and how society would see you. Um, c- could you kind of go into that more as well as kind of what I mean, did you, what were your fears, if any, that that issue could be an impediment to realizing what you wanted to do professionally? Yeah. I, I mean, it was a, a constant struggle and a constant source of, of, of fear and anxiety. Um, I remember the first time I found out that there were other people like me. I was about 10 or 11 years old. I was upstairs in my parents' house watching um, a sitcom with my mom. And during the course of the episode, a guest character is introduced, played by the beautiful Jenny McCarthy. And none of the other characters in the show know that she's transgender, but the audience knows. And the story arc basically developed that every single time a, a, another character on the show would express any kind of romantic interest in the character, the laugh track would cue. And I turned to my mother in this moment and I asked her, you know, is that real? Are there people like that? And she said, yes, they're, they're called transgender or something like that. Worried that even asking the question myself would, would, would raise questions about me. And what could have been a life affirming moment of realizing that, that I wasn't alone was soul crushing because every single time I heard that laugh track, it sent a really, really, frankly, dangerous message, soul crushing message, because at 10 years old, you don't know a lot, but you know, you don't want to be a joke. And so I think about how different my life could have been if that first exposure to a trans person had been an affirming celebratory um, storyline, the kinds that we're seeing more and more of now, fortunately, in, in art and entertainment. But because of that first experience, coupled with the overwhelming messages that society sends to us that being trans is, is unworthy of love, um, that being trans is something to be ashamed of or to be mocked and ridiculed, um, that it kept me inside of myself for the first 21 years of my life. And, and, and as I had this, this dream, it wasn't about running for office or, or, or gaining a position or, or, or an elected office. It was because I, I wanted to make a difference in my community. And it seemed impossible to me growing up that I could have a seat at any table and make a difference in my community if I was also out as trans. And it was abundantly clear to me that my dreams and my identity were mutually exclusive, at least it seemed at that point. And so that, that, that fear that I couldn't be out and, and love and be loved, that I couldn't live in a community that I loved and that I couldn't do the work that I love that kept me inside of myself until eventually I was at college. Like so many, uh, when they're at college, they go through that period of self-discovery I was student body president at American University, and I was working on a whole host of issues I cared about from LGBTQ equality to accessibility for students with disability to empowering students of every economic background to be able to pursue opportunity. Um, It was in that experience, 
realizing that it was professionally fulfilling, but it did not heal the pain. And again, if anything, only highlighted that incongruence that I finally gained the courage, the confidence and the insights to come out to my family. Um, and I, and I did so sitting in this, <laughs> sitting in this room with uh, the Christmas tree behind me, I came out uh, on Christmas day in 2011 to my family. And, and it was a challenging okay. conversation, but my parents made clear from the start that they loved me and supported me. And then you would come out over and over and over and over until you didn't have to. Um, and at working, you know, in so many different campaigns and several campaigns. So to me, as a civilian and looking from the outside in, it was very clear what path you would take. You know, you almost uh, learn very early on that uh, Sarah McBride is going to be what Jen Bishop had described and read off your bio that once sworn in will be one, you know, the most powerful elected uh, leader, LGBTQ leader, um, or trans, I should say, transgender, um, in, in the in the country as as a first out state senator. Talk about the 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 first. I I I'm going to back up because you're also the first out trans person to speak at the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, which happened in 2016, and that was a big deal. I still remember the speech and I still remember getting the goosebumps. And I think that was a pivotal moment for me, even though I knew that, you know, I knew who I was supporting and yes, I was with her. Uh, But there was something that you said that, you know, will we be a nation where there's only one way to love, one way to look, one way to live, or will we be a nation where everyone has the freedom to live openly and equally a nation that's stronger together? Uh, would love to hear you go back and talk about one, you know, being tapped to speak at the DNC and what that was like. And then two, writing the speech and what you wanted to say and the impact you wanted to have. You know, it's, it's sometimes I, 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 I almost forget that that happened because it's such a surreal experience. It was such a surreal experience. Um, I had been involved in, in advocacy for years prior to working here in Delaware and then eventually nationally uh, leading up to my, my time uh, at the human rights campaign as their national press secretary. And as we approached the summer of 2016 and the, the upcoming democratic election, as we saw trans people you know, increasingly organized and mobilized in the context of our political space, as we saw trans people come under such explicit attack in places like North Carolina in 2016, there were increasing conversations in the community about the desire to have a trans person speak at the Democratic National Convention. Um, it seemed like the the, the right time. Um, it seemed like a, an appropriate reflection of the prominence of our community and the prominence of the issues that impact our community. Um, it seemed only fair to have trans voices included in a more prominent way. And so there were increasing conversations and 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 one of the challenges for a democratic convention is so many of the speakers are elected officials, but they're really weren't any out trans elected officials in 2016. And the LGBT caucus in on the Hill, on, on, on Capitol Hill, made up of the co-chairs who are out LGBTQ members and then the, the rank and file of, of the, the caucus is made up of allies. They were given seven minutes on the stage. All, every caucus in the house was. And they decided much to their credit that it was that they felt strongly that that it was time to break that barrier to to have a transgender person speak from the main stage of the Democratic National Convention. And so they decided effectively to cede half of their time to a transgender person that that they ended up choosing to stand on stage with the caucus and and to to speak. And a couple of weeks before the convention, I had heard my name was in the running with like 30 or 40 people. Um, but I didn't think much of it. Uh, Then I would say two weeks before the convention, I had been told, I was told that I was the name that the caucus had put forward to the DNC and the Clinton campaign. 
that I was undergoing vetting. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't want to count my chickens before they hatched. So I was, uh, you know, a ball of nerves for that week waiting. And then a week before, just a couple days before the convention, I got a message from the campaign that I was, I passed vetting and that I would be the, the person who would speak. Um, and I didn't realize at that moment what it would be. I, I had gotten used to seeing how eager Democrats were to work on trans rights on the Hill. So I had sort of seen very clearly the party embrace our cause. I didn't realize, I don't think because I was in such a bubble, that this would have been the first time folks outside of federal advocacy and Washington, D.C. were seeing the Democratic Party so clearly embrace trans rights as a cause that they are fighting for and our dignity uh, as, as part of our movement and, and the movement um, for progressive goals. And, you know, it was, a, it was a whirlwind of a week. And I spoke on the final night of the convention a few hours before Hillary accepted the nomination. And I remember being re- obviously very nervous before going out. I, I knew that all the networks would be covering the speech live since it was a a significant moment in convention history. And right before I go on, the uh, person says to me, now listen, the arena is full of people. We're in the Wells Fargo arena where, you know, huge arena, tens of thousands of people. Everyone is here to hear Hillary and they are going to be milling about not listening to any speech and the intent and, and the, and the, the, the consequence is that the speakers oftentimes will try to start to yell and scream and be really charismatic to invite the audience in. And they said, you're not speaking to the people in that arena. You're speaking to the people on television. And when you start to yell to get the attention of the people in the arena, it looks terrible on television. You'll look unhinged. And I thought, oh God, I, I, I'm going to not, I'm going to just start sort of viscerally instinctually trying to get the audience's attention and starting to project and yell and I'm going to look terrible on television. And also my parents are here and they're so excited. And if they're looking around the arena and no one cares, are they going to be really disappointed? But then I walked out on stage and for the first time that evening, the audience was cheering. And for the first time that evening, as we began to speak, the audience was listening and quiet and attentive. And, you know, in that arena, because they light it so well for television, for the convention, you can see all the way up into the rafters. You can see everyone, which meant that I could also see my parents standing right under the Delaware delegation sign. And I looked at them and I thought, you were so scared when I came out. You were so worried that I was giving up any kind of future. And here we are watching tens of thousands of people not applaud me, but applaud trans people and our dignity and our rights and our cause. And I hope you know that it's going to be okay. I hope you know that you don't have to worry as much anymore. So it was a powerful experience. And I think it was, it was part of not in any way, a a major part of, but a part of this growing momentum toward greater trans participation in in politics. You know, we had my speech in 2016, then Danica Rome gets elected in 2017, and then three more trans candidates in 2018 in state legislatures, and then what we just saw in the 2020 election. And and it's a reminder that you can't be what you can't see. But once there's that one possibility model, and then two possibility models, and then three possibility models, everything becomes more possible. And, 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 and eventually, that progress becomes a cascade. And I think we're in that moment right now. What does it feel like to you, to you being that person, that positive example now that some 10 or 11 year old kid is looking at and saying, oh, there are people like me and they're looking at you. Yeah, I was, I was on a um, Zoom with a local GSA today. Um, and that's one of my favorite things is to talk to young LGBTQ people long before I got elected. Um, because to me, meeting these young LGBTQ people who are doing what once seemed so impossible to me as a kid growing up, they are both living their truth and dreaming big dreams all at the same time, it demonstrates how far we've come. 
the mere fact that these young LGBTQ people exist today as out proud and bold people, it, it shows our progress. It's demonstrated that we as a community have transformed impossibility into possibility into reality. And so I find a lot of hope in, in them and in the change they represent. I also know how much of a difference it would have made for me as a kid to see someone like me get elected to public office. I, I, I honestly can't imagine how much of a difference, actually. I, I know how it would have made a huge difference, but I can't imagine what my life would have been like. The idea of growing up here, as much as I love this community and as good as the people are, and I know they are so good, in 1995, 1996, 1997, hell, in 2003, 2004, 2005, the idea that this community would be represented in the state Senate by a trans person seemed almost incomprehensible to me. And, and, and so I am hopeful that my election and the election of more and more trans people help to send a message to a young person here in Delaware or anywhere else in this country, that no matter the slurs they heard around the dinner table, no matter the names they were called on the playground, that they can live their truth and dream, dream big dreams all at the same time to know that their voice matters and that our democracy is big enough for them too. But ultimately, I also know that the only way I can honor whatever symbolic role I play within our community, the only way that I can ensure that there are, are more trans people who are able to run and win and serve is to do the best job I can for the residents of this district, to be the best state senator I can be, and to fight for progress on all of the issues that matter to my neighbors and that matter to all of us in our own community. Sarah, I know for a fact that, you know, these aren't just words that you stand by and uh, or words that you get on a platform and you speak of. Uh, you've done you've done the work. I mean, you know, voluntary campaigns, but specifically speaking of working on a bill such as passing a non-discrimination bill in your home state, Delaware. Um, what would you say to those young activists, those the the future generations that you have a whole lot of faith and hope for? but live in states like Texas or even Georgia where elected leaders are trying to pass anti-trans bills because it can feel daunting and you can feel hopeless, you know, at some point when it seems like they keep winning. Well, I think first and foremost is we, we can't lose track of how far we've come and that, Every single time an anti-transgender or anti-LGBTQ politician comes for us, we end up having a conversation with our community and our country that serves to open hearts, change minds, and in the end sows the seeds of the destruction of the politics of hate that those elected officials seek to implement. History is on our side. Empathy and compassion are on our side. And each battle, we might, we might not win every single battle, but time and time again, we see that we are winning the war. Time and time again, we see in the long course of history, as frustrating as that is, that the arc of the moral universe does bend toward justice. And, you know, I decided to run for office because of the experiences I've had over the last particularly 10 years. Because I am as hopeful as I've ever been for all the challenges we face, that change remains possible, that we have it within ourselves and our community, the power individually and collectively to bring about seemingly impossible change. Because I've seen it, I I've fought for it and I've lived it. And, you know, right now we, we face, and this is not just to young people, this is to everyone, because I think right now it's easy to look at our politics it's easy to look at what ha what's happening at the federal level and just become so dispirited, so disgusted, and so cynical about the capacity of our system of government to work. And it is true, we have some fundamental problems. We are dealing with longstanding prejudices that helped give rise to people like Donald Trump. But the other threat to our democracy beyond the prejudice that exists and that remains is also the threat of, of a government that 
can no longer effectively and efficiently meet the needs of the people. Democracies can't survive when they, when they aren't delivering progress, which is one of the reasons why in countries that get consumed by gridlock, you see strong men and authoritarians rise up on a platform of I alone can fix it. I can bust through with my strong personality and sheer force of will the, 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 the gridlock and the barriers in order to deliver progress. And we can either have a single person through authoritarian means and authoritarian rhetoric and authoritarian intent bust through that gridlock or we the people can do it. And, and what is so necessary right now is to have people of diverse backgrounds who understand that the political is personal, who understand the stakes of these issues, who believe in a pluralistic democratic society. We need them to stay involved. We need them to run for office because it is those people, it is all of us that have the perseverance because we understand what's at stake. To, to do what is necessary to overcome the structural barriers that are in place, the institutional barriers that are in place, the prejudices that exist in order to deliver progress, in order to effectively and efficiently meet the needs of the people. And so we can either have an authoritarian who cares nothing of, it, of individuals, who cares nothing of a pluralistic democratic society who does not care and frankly, for whom the cruelty is the point when it comes to marginalized communities, we can either have that kind of person, not just Donald Trump, anyone take power or we can take power and ensure that the system of government works for us, not for an individual's gain. And that requires us to stay involved. It requires particularly those of us in the LGBTQ community, people of color, people with disabilities, religious minorities, women, everyone, to keep up the fight, to stay involved and to run for office and to serve because it's only when we have those types of people in place that we'll be able to preserve our democracy by making progress. Very well said. Tell us about your Senate race. How did it, from kind of getting into it and how smooth or, or challenging was it? Uh, when did you feel confident that you've got it set? I mean, take us through this historic race. You know, it, it, it was, um, it feels like almost a, 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 a story in two, two big parts, pre-COVID and, and, and during COVID. Um, my state senator, my, my former state senator, the state senator who had represented me my entire life, longtime Democratic lion of the Senate, the original sort of progressive fighter in the Delaware State Senate, Harris McDowell, in July of 2019, decided to retire. And I had been thinking about, you know, getting involved and, and, and maybe uh, exploring a new chapter in my own work and my own advocacy. And when that position um, opened up, when Harris decided to retire, it felt like the right place for me to put my time and energy into trying to make change in my community. And I saw working at the human rights campaign that most of the issues that matter to us are handled at the state level. And that for all that gridlock in Washington, state legislatures are uniquely positioned to meet the scope and scale of the challenges we face with big ideas um, to serve as those laboratories of democracy. And so I decided to run. And I was very lucky that I started in July of 2019, long before COVID. So I was able to be knocking on doors for several months. Uh, and then COVID hit and we moved our campaign virtual. Delaware, since you know it's such a small state, our politics is really fueled by voter contact. Voters expect to meet you. They expect to have you knock on their door or talk to you. They want to understand who you are and what, and why you're running, what you want to do and why you want to do it. Um, it's a, a really beautiful process, but COVID obviously presented significant challenges. Um, I faced, this is a, a fairly democratic district. I faced a democratic primary um, and then a, a, eventually a Republican opponent. Um, my Democratic primary, we took it very seriously. We worked our hearts out. We had an incredible team of volunteers and supporters. A great campaign manager named Phoebe Lucas 
We talked to thousands of voters and we were able to win the Democratic primary with 91% of the vote. And then in just two months later, our, the general election occurred. Um, and the general election, um, despite it being a more Democratic district, was a, a much more um, contentious race. Um, my opponent uh, sought to make my gender identity an issue, something I certainly anticipated. He accused me of um, wanting to teach sex acts to preschoolers. Um, they used really heinous, notorious anti-LGBTQ stereotypes um, in their campaign against me, sort of painting LGBTQ people as a threat to children, um, a tired trope. Um, but fortunately, voters responded the way um, I, I hoped and, 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 and believed they would respond, which is as fair-minded people who were judging candidates based on their ideas and their experiences, not their identities. And I think the results again in November demonstrated that, um, that despite the attacks that, that were leveled against me based on my identity, my Republican opponent actually did worse than any Republican nominee for the seat in, um, in history that we have records for. Um, wow. So, you know, again, it's a demonstration of the fact that not only are voters not looking at those types of, of attacks, but that they're counterproductive. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about the mandate that we have. And I ran, you know, not as a trans candidate. I ran as a healthcare candidate and a paid leave candidate. I ran as someone who wanted to increase the minimum wage and reimagine our criminal justice system. And I think voters responded to that to that message of, of optimistic, um, of an optimistic vision of meaningful change um, and of uh, of a positive, inclusive vision for our state. We have just a few minutes left with Sarah, so we'll open it up to the audience. If you do have questions or comments, uh, now would be a good time to send them. Otherwise, John and I will t take it on through. We have so many questions. We probably want to keep Sarah all night. Um, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sarah, speaking of the hate, you know, I, I do feel like there is a turn or a change that's happening. Obviously, you know, we're seeing voters of America who want to see a change. At the same time, we're coming off of a pretty uh, divisive, you know, chapter, one of the most, in, at least in my generation that I've seen, um, and, and not just divisive, but yes, hate filled, uh, and attacks on, you know, people's gender and their identity, their race. What are your thoughts, you know, now that you will be one of our elected leaders in the, the healing process and uniting the country and bringing us together, knowing that there is a good percentage of us here in this country, you know, who want to see us come together. Yeah, you know, I, I think that it, it's such a good question because I do think that for as, as real as the differences are politically and ideolo ideologically, the only path forward for all of us really has to include some degree of healing. And what I'm about to say is not a silver bullet and it by no means will solve everything, but I do think it's part of the solution. Um, I think right now we have all done a poor job of seeing the pain of people who disagree with us. And I think sometimes we think that if we see that pain, we will validate their prejudice. But I don't think that that's true. I think we can hold those contradictory notions in ourselves and, and in our hands and, and still fight for justice for everyone and still see everyone's pain. That a person's pain can be very real, even if they hold positions that you find abhorrent. A person can be deserving of justice, even if you disagree with them, even if they do not believe that you are deserving of justice, they can still be deserving of justice. In fact, they are deserving of justice. And I think one of the things we tend to do right now is we tend to justify our own pain and, and, and convince one another of our own pain by diminishing the pain of the other. 
And I think that that's true across the political divide. You see Democrats and, and folks who make up the Democratic coalition, myself included, sometimes saying, my pain's real, your pain isn't real, Republican voters. And Republican voters then then say as well, or say prior to, your pain isn't real cosmopolitan urban elite. My pain is real. You have no idea what it's like to live in a post-industrial town. And I think that when we do that, when we, when we, when we seek to validate our own pain by diminishing the experiences of others, we end up pushing each of us further into our respective corners. I know when I'm upset, the worst thing a person can do for me, and it's always well-intentioned, is try to convince me why the person didn't actually mean what hurt me, why it's not as bad as I think. And, and it's always done with good intentions. They're always trying to make me feel better. But what ends up happening is I feel a, a, a very frustrating desire then to defend my pain. And, and in defending my pain, I only get angrier and more frustrated. The first step in healing is always for someone else to validate your pain. And I think we all have to do a better job of validating each other's pain, of seeing and hearing and feeling each other's pain and, and not feeling the need to diminish someone else's pain because they're wrong or in order to make us feel like our pain is, is real. And to recognize that that pursuit for justice is not a transaction, that it's an absolute moral imperative regardless of how imperfect the person who we're pursuing justice for may be. And frankly, that's when it's most important, when we have every reason to not want to fight for justice for that person. That's when principles matter. That's when you have to have the courage to act is when you can have seemingly altruistic reasons to give up on them. And so I think, I think all of us need to hold these deeply contradictory feelings within ourselves and understand that, that we can have those feelings. We can understand that these things might not add up, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to fight for one another. And I think if we do that, we will start to heal and start to lay the foundation for us to come together. That's really interesting. I, I recall, you know, Bill Clinton's first presidential race, and he would often be talking to various voters around the country who were going through, you know, a, a deep recession at the time. And his line was, you know, I feel your pain. And I, th I think there was often the... Uh, the assumption that, that, okay, that's his political line. But I mean, what he was saying was, I hear you. I, I am understanding that this is a real issue for you. And, uh, you know, any trust you put in to me and voting for me is because you expect that I understand your pain and, and, and uh, what's hurting you. And I don't um, think it's required of elected officials. I think it's required of all of us as, as, as people. Yeah. It's a difficult thing for a lot of us to keep in mind, I think, especially in the age of, uh, you know, daily Twitter outrage um, manufacturing. Um, so I wanted to ask about, because you said earlier that, you know, the state governments are, are kind of this unique place to, to address so many issues. Um, and one of our, our viewers asks about, you know, what are we going to do about homelessness and how do you deal with, you know, taxes that are through the roof and all this stuff. And I want to kind of phrase, cause we could kind of go down a lot of different issues, but I want to put this in the umbrella of, I think a lot of local and state governments are really strapped and they're going to be strapped right now because of, you know, economic crisis, the pandemic costs, you know, all that stuff. So maybe talk a bit about what, either constraints or opportunities that you see that state government can do in dealing with some really serious issues like this in this time when they may not find, you know, either their own revenue coming in very well, or maybe, you know, kind of chintzy help from the federal government. Yeah. You're, well, you're absolutely right. And that's certainly as a incoming state legislate legislator, one of the, the challenges is, you know, the federal government is, is, is able to deficit spend. Um, and and states either can't or or are completely forbidden constitutionally from from doing so. Um, 
And so it presents a real challenge and we aren't seeing the support yet from the federal government that we need. The CARES Act was critical, although it had very significant strings attached to it. You couldn't spend that money to fill revenue holes that were occurring through no fault of the state's management, but because of the revenue decline due to COVID and the economic crisis. And so my hope is that there is a possibility for some more support, even if it does have strings attached to it from the federal government, because there are ongoing significant costs related to COVID that will exist long before the CARES Act, CARES Act expires. Um, and my hope though, is that a, 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 a Joe Biden presidency, even if there's still a Republican Senate with a Democratic House, that maybe we could see a second round of stimulus that will help state governments face the, the financial toll that this crisis has taken on them, recognizing that we have both obligations that pre-existed COVID, obligations that are a direct result of COVID, and then frankly, obligations morally to meet this moment with significant action. Um, that to honor the lives that have been lost, the people who have lost loved ones and the people who have lost their jobs, we owe it to them to, to tackle some of the intra seemingly intractable issues that we have not yet tackled. Because it's always in moments of crises that we take our biggest steps forward. And it's, always, and it's in this moment where we're forced to reimagine so much that we are, we are not fulfilling our duty to meet in, 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 in meeting this moment of reimagination in our world if we don't also reimagine government policy. And so I, th I think we have this obligation on so many fronts to do more, um, but at a time when we have less, which is a challenge. Um, and, and so I think there's a couple things. One, I think that there are without question what I call compassionate cost savings that states can, can make. Um, there is significant reform to our criminal justice system that could free up much needed government funding for social safety net programs that we need. But we also, we also, and we also know that while this is especially true at the federal level, this is also true at the state level, that with interest rates, interest rates at historic lows, we should be borrowing in order to, to put people back to work, especially when it comes to construction jobs. Um, and that if we then put people back to work, it will help increase revenue and give us the funds necessary to do other long-term social safety net improvements and changes to improve our public education system, to bring down the cost of healthcare. Um, and so I, I think the challenges we're facing call on us to be creative, to make difficult decisions, but we can't use the revenue challenges we have as an excuse to just say, you know what? It's just too difficult. We can't meet this moment with, with, with real progress. I think if anything, it, it actually in, in many ways enhances our capacity to, to, to make some of the dis difficult decisions that we should have made a long time ago. Um, and because of the crisis and people's deeper understanding of the need, for instance, of policies like paid family and medical leave, which Delaware has yet to pass, to, to, to recognize that there is a unique moment here where the public understands how connected these issues are and how necessary these policies are for us to util, for us to, 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 to harness that energy and support for those policies to actually implement them into law. Um, but it's gonna take difficult choices. It's gonna take us making those compassionate cost savings, particularly in the criminal justice system. Um, to, to free up some of the some of the funding that might be necessary for those initial investments. Whoops. Unmute. <laughs> Sarah, it's been so incredible to spend time with you. And again, like it's it's such a an honor and a treat to have you uh, here at the Commonwealth Club of California and part of the Michelle Miao show for our last program of the year. The last question we have for you is, I mean, really the, the final thoughts we, as we wind down and we're at a critical moment in U.S. history when it comes to public health to get through the next few weeks 
Uh, at the same time, we have, you know, folks like you and President-elect Biden and President, or Vice President-elect Kamala Harris to look forward to and the rest of the others who have won their campaigns to want to make the change in 2021. If you could leave us with some parting thoughts of what we could look forward to and uh, the type of work that you, you'll do and that we all need to do together, um, that would be amazing. Well, first off, I, I, I want to thank you again for having me on. I've really enjoyed this conversation. It, it's so good to spend some time w- with you two. Um, you know, I, I think my hope is that we have seen in this moment how connected these issues are. We have seen how we can't have a thriving economy if we don't have a healthy society. Um, We have seen what Audre Lorde said, that there's no such thing as a single issue cause because no one lives single issue lives. We've seen how public health impacts our economy, how public health impacts education, how public health impacts criminal justice and public safety. We have seen how interconnected not just these issues are, but how connected we all are. How my responsibility to wear a mask isn't just about my own health. It's about, if not just about, it's, it's, it's even more about protecting the other person. We see how our own actions have a ripple effect for other people. And so it is my hope that as we look around and, and we see the cir- service and sacrifice by so many in our communities, as we look around and see that interconnectedness, that we learn the lessons of this moment, that we carry the solidarity and the sacrifice that we're seeing right now with us one, even after this crisis is over, um, that we keep this, this perspective that we have in this moment as we seek to tackle some of the biggest issues of our time and I think as a community, when, when, when I think about us as an LGBTQ community, the beautiful, diverse, brave community that we are, and I think about all that we have done, I, have see, I think about the change that the three of us have seen in our short lives, change that once seemed impossible. And as upsetting as sometimes the national news is, as, as understandable as it is to get, to get discouraged, when I reflect on that progress, when I reflect on how far we've come, I can't help, feel, can't help but feel hopeful about our capacity to meet these challenges, to bring about change. And I feel very strongly as a new elected official that in a position of public trust, I have a moral and sacred responsibility to do as much good as I can And I hope all of us feel that in whatever role we play, that we all have a responsibility to do as much good for each other as we can. Sarah, thank you so much again. And thank you for your service and all that you've done for our community. And uh, I feel so blessed and so lucky to have you a part of our community. um, And that is the LGBTQ community and all, and you know, others. Um, Happy holidays and thank you again. Thank you to you who've joined us tonight for our last program of 2020. But of course, there's more to come. And so I'll leave John with the last words. Well, I want to uh, also give my thanks to you, Sarah, and congratulations on your your election. Um, I know we're going to be hearing a lot from you in the future. So we look forward to having you on again in the future. Everyone else, happy holidays. Thank you for making it through this year. We look forward to seeing you both virtually and eventually in person at the Commonwealth Club. Um, And uh, you know what? We couldn't have ended a year on a better note than having those inspiring words from Sarah McBride. So everybody take care of yourself and take care of each other. Have a good night. Happy holidays.